First on, on my left is Peter Luskin, who's the managing director and co-founder of the Center for Operational Analysis and Research and has done remarkable work in Syria and Afghanistan and around the world. And to his left, you see Roger Meyerson, who is the Glenn A. Lloyd Distinguished Service Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago, a Pearson Institute affiliate, and a Nobel Prize winner in economics. And we are incredibly grateful to have your expertise. I'd like to dive in, turning to you, Peter, thinking about um, the issues we've heard about throughout the day of the best of intentions for donors or for Western states in driving improvement in these war-torn areas can often go awry and how what looks good on paper can be perverted in practice. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you've seen the translation of donor intentions to practical import on the ground. Uh, that's a very good question. And, and I guess to start, um, I really appreciate being here. And uh, it's been wonderful to hear a lot of kind of uplifting stories like Grace's story. Um, Syria is uh, just a disaster. Um, and uh, I, I don't know how else to put it right now. Uh, so we're at a point in this conflict where, where the government of Syria is essentially retaken uh, the vast majority of previously opposition-held areas. Um, they're bracing for kind of their final offensive, which will take place likely in the next year. Um, so, so what we're left with right now is, uh, let's say, uh, the pieces of civil society that, that we've kind of, as the West, have collectively contributed to over the last, you know, five years, six years. Um, I guess one of the biggest challenges in the Syrian conflict was that, um, and we're talking about governance structures, uh, was that these local councils, which which rose, uh, I guess came together in you know roughly 2012, um, they they were funded by you know different Western countries, but but they never had uh, a monopoly on service provision and they never had a monopoly on the use of violence, um, which is to say, you know, like the judiciary would be paid for by the Swedes, and it was going direct to judges. Service provision was being taken care of by INGOs. Armed groups were receiving their money, you know, neither directly from the West or, for, or from the Gulf. Um, then as a consequence, uh, these attempts at unifying the opposition failed. I, I think the Syrian opposition probably also uh, deserves some credit for that. But um, yeah, we we collect collectively fragmented this, and, and I'd say the most important aspect of it is is in service provision. So, so that's an interesting thread you're picking up on from panels we've heard earlier in the day about the contrast between a fragile state versus a fragmented state and the role in which, uh, the role that centralization plays in strengthening or weakening the existence of state infrastructure necessary to support the restoring of social order. And I want to turn to Roger and put that to you in thinking about how governance matters and the right balance between a centralized authority versus local tribal councils or, or local groups that might be more accountable to the people on the ground. Yeah, I think um, with the University of Chicago and the Harris School are they're trying to understand, uh, as, as social scientists, the foundations of successful societies. Um, and uh, this, this area is a terrible test case that, we, that, that, that forces us to think very hard about it. Um, I come from a general prejudice of, 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 of every, thinking about, about, such, about problems such as we've been talking about all day. Uh, I've come to believe an important proposition that's underappreciated would be that, that the foundations of a strong, prosperous state depend on a balanced constitutional relationship between uh, national political leaders and local leaders who are accountable within their communities. That is to say, the strong, strong state, the United States developed from local roots that, were, that had local and provincial government uh, that was accountable, democratically accountable to, to, to residents 100 years before we had our first national election. And uh, this is a country maybe unique in the world where the, the national constitution had to be um, 
ratified separately by the provinces. The, the political processes in the provinces determined uh, whether the national constitution was accepted. Uh, so, so a balance, but, and, and, and this country was founded on a, the concept of a balance between national and, and, uh, and local government. Uh, and that is something that Americans have not taken sufficiently out, I think, in, in, in thinking about helping other countries. We, 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 we think about democracy, but we don't think about federalism, which is absolutely fundamental to our country. Um, what makes a state weak or fragile? Um, and I think the, the answer is either elite networks are too narrow to effectively govern, or rivalries uh, between different groups uh, prevent the consolidation of an effective state. And either way, the result is, 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 is misery for people who live there and the source of violence. Narrowness, let me just say, because the, the, the international assistance community can, can provoke this, uh, can exacerbate these problems. These are political problems of a country, of a, of a, of a region, of the people in a, of a society. But the international community can, can, can um, exacerbate the narrowness problem because when international assistance is channeled through national leaders, uh, it gives those national leaders uh, less reason to try to be inclusive, to negotiate the hard deals with, 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 uh, with local elites outside of the capital, uh, and you end up a narrow state one way. And of course, the other way is when, when different countries that may be international rivals back inter different rival groups within a country, we help to tear it apart. So either way, international assistance may bear some of the guilt for, for a weak state. I would say both of these effects exist in, on steroids in, in a monstrous version in Syria. Syria exists, but uh, there is a state which has specialized in trying, in trying to be narrow to make sure that nobody is trusted for the provision of local public goods and, 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 and justice, uh, uh, um, and uh, that the state controls, state connections are necessary for protection and for, and for public services. Uh, and they will use, they, they, they have per perfected the use of international recognition as a way of, of profiting and 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 in the in this when 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 people rose up in Syria against the state, um, perhaps because there wasn't a unified backing from the from the from from the the, the, uh, the if if the Western states Western nations had provided some sort of unified backing for the revolution, perhaps it could have succeeded. But uh, instead, it, 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 different backers have created conflict, and uh, um, and to some extent, the state itself, the, the Assad regime itself, was uh, deliberately exacerbating that. Yeah, and I think that's this is this interesting place that we're at right now, which is um, in the last nine months, uh, let's say the the vast majority of opposition-held areas have been reconciled, uh, and that's the word that people use, but it's 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 not really the right word. It's kind of an Orwellian word, uh, as I think someone spoke to earlier on the last panel, uh, it's these besieged areas, which which were besieged for five or six years, uh, which itself is an interesting thing to discuss briefly. Uh, in that, you know, how can this happen, right? I mean, well, the only way you can happen or to have a siege that lasts for five years is because somebody's profiting it off of it, right? I mean, for up until, let's say, the fall of 2016, siege was simply a way for the regime to earn hard currency um, and basically prey upon uh, people trapped in these areas. Uh, anyway, following the Russian intervention, uh, we've seen, I guess, beginning in the winter of 2016 with uh, Madai and Zabadani, uh, and then kind of up until now, which we saw uh, last July was the the fall of uh, the South. Um, it's, it's a process called reconciliation. And basically, I think it was spoken to earlier, it's, it's local capitulation. Uh, but what's really interesting about this process is, is how um, armed actors, who you would think would be the ones who, who can most uh, directly challenge the state, these guys are reconciled. And in fact, in the South, you had uh, the 4th Armored Division was uh, basically competing with, with the Fifth Corps, which is backed by the Russians, to reconcile as many combatants as possible and then to throw them on the next front line. Whereas service providers, uh, which is to say kind of humanitarians, um, although probably not humanitarians in the traditional sense of the word because they are, they are political actors, and uh, local council leaders, civil society, uh, these guys are all basically forcibly displaced. And, and that, by the way, is the last step of the reconciliation is they bring in the buses, the green buses, and they put you on and send you to the north. 
Um, so I mean, what this, uh, and we've done a bunch of research about this, about kind of the incorporation of armed actors. Um, but what it speaks to is that the Syrian war has been essentially a war of service provision. And then I guess this goes back to the donor policies we were talking about earlier. Um, you know, humanitarian is a very easy thing to fund. Uh, it's, it seems to be less controversial, right? But in the context of, of let's say, a fragile state, uh, in the context of a kind of a complex crisis, uh, providing services was uh, directly challenging the legitimacy of the regime. And for this reason, uh, the, these are the people who are never coming home, uh, whereas the guys who carried weapons, uh, you know, I mean, they're not welcomed back, I don't think, but, but I mean, they, they remain in their communities uh, and have not been penalized to the extent that, that one would have expected. Yeah. So, so then how do Western powers the U.S. and others act as a force for good in the distribution of aid? How do they interact with local councils or local groups to make sure that aid is getting where it's doing the most good and to keep those groups from being co-opted by a regime that may have different interests? Yeah, so, so, so this is uh, really challenging because because even the definition of, of, of humanitarian aid, I guess, is kind of up in the air. Um, you, you know, multi-mandate humanitarian organizations, you know, do things from the emergency humanitarian response all the way to uh, peace building and reconstruction. Um, by and large, it's it's based upon this idea that that that, that they're neutral and impartial actors. Uh, but in the Syrian conflict, they're they're not, um, and and so I think. Um, even though it's very easy to, 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 to channel aid, these the organizations will not work with political entities, right? I mean, the UN pooled fund uh, and almost all humanitarians worked instead through uh, local civil society, right? Um, so uh, I, I don't quite know what the answer is because on the one hand, um, to, to question the neutrality of humanitarians and to say, you know, you must program this money through a local council would, would obviously jeopardize their community acceptance. On the other hand, uh, doing it this other way, which is allowing kind of local civil society to deliver services, effectively undermines the sovereignty of any governance structure that you want to create. I, th I think the point is that uh, while well, we recognize that a broad, inclusive uh, civil society is the foundations of, 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 of a strong state. This, this is what exactly what the, 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 the Assad regime has worked to, to undermine systematically. Uh, that, uh, and to the extent that people who have some independence and some local accountability of, uh, have, any, have, been a lot, have been permitted to have any, any local leadership prestige in, in, in Syria, my understanding is it's almost it's exclusively people who, who are within a narrow sectarian group. As long as it's sectarian, especially if there's suspicion between different sects and different eth tribal or ethnic groups, uh, then the regime is, is maybe prepared to tolerate that. But, uh, and it's remarkable, as you say, that the foot soldiers who fought for the revolution have been able to, to, to give up their arms, put the gun down, and then the regime gives them a gun back and says, now you're welcome to the army. You're, yeah. you know, and, and, and they've been assimilated. But the civil society people were, were, were the people who were forming local councils. The, the proudest achievement of the Syrian revolutionaries from 2011 was the establishment of broad, inclusive, multi-sect, cross-sectarian local councils to build trust, and that's exactly what's most threatened by the regime. Those are the people who they know they want to, want to, want to suppress. Uh, I quote from Rick Barton's book, excellent book, Peace Works, page 176, if you like, where he reports that the, he, he describes that, yeah, the, it, Rick Barton's Peace Works, the, he, he, does, he reports that unfortunately the U.S. government just often acted like it didn't know how to engage with local groups. There was a desire to have a national front on top of it, and that was something that the, this, the, the Assad regime was very good at, at, at manipulating the, the, to prevent the, the creation of. of, of. And, uh, um, but I think what I would emphasize here is and without support from the West, the Syrian revolution was betrayed and perverted by sectarian militias who sometimes would, pervert, would then purge other factions from the local councils. 
uh, and, the, and the local councils that were inclusive that remain, those are the ones that the Assad regime is most threatened by. I think the, the U.S. and, the, and U, the, uh, the European Union in particular has, has a huge, it is right, let me say, it is right for all of us, it is humanly right to try to help want the Syrian people to, to, to have a country that they should want to return to. But, the, but Europeans uh, have a particular, with refugee, with the refugee horde on, the, on, on, on their borders, uh, have, have a, a, a real material interest also in supporting uh, the, the reconstruction of Syria as a place to, that Syrians should want to return to. Uh, what good can we do? We have very, the, 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 Europe and the West have very little leverage, but I would want to say to maximize what little leverage is available, and I think Europe was probably going to be the leader in this, would be to offer generous budgets for reconstruction with wide-eyed that, that, that the Assad regime does welcome this, hoping to profit from it. And to some extent, some of the, the, the Assad regime would prefer that that money all be managed, all the profits from the contract should go to Ba'athist connected people, and, and, they should only, and they should not go to, to, to communities. The communities that, that, that rebelled the longest should be left to starve. Um, so the, the aid has to be given in a way that where there's local control. I would say a, a initial demand would be, we're going to give you more money than you thought we would for reconstruction, but we insist that in every district, we're going to be allowed to open a district reconstruction office. The, the international assistance from Europe and America should go, and there should be a district reconstruction officer who's going to connect with the old civil society people and say, what do you really need? Uh, who can we trust to deliver it? Some fraction of the profits of our money are going to go to Ba'athist connection people, and of course we want to help those communities also. But the, the, the communities that were loyal to Assad deserve help in reconstructing. But the threat of, but then the, the, we, the international community needs to be ready when those local people, when those local development officers say, we're getting resistance, the people we're talking to are being systematically arrested, they're not allowing us to help the communities that rebel the longest, then the whole process has got to be shut down and international, uh, the, the governments at the highest level need to say, Syria is not allowing us to help their own people um, because they're insisting that it all be a political uh, crutch for the regime. Uh, and we're not we're, we're withdrawing the money until this is until these 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 demands are met. Uh, I think that's kind of detailed engagement uh, that allows local voices local uh, that is sensitive where national policy is sensitive to local political voices in Syria is the best we can do to not just create a nation but to to actually have positive political uh, impact for the future of Syria as a, as a nation. Yeah, I guess I'd echo that and say just just don't give it to UNDP. Uh, that would be the worst possible thing, because uh, they're they're quite close to the regime. Uh, but yeah, I mean, barring that, uh, what else would work would be to continue doing exactly what we've been doing, and that it was a mistake for the last six years, and that it, you know, caused a fair amount of political fragmentation. But moving forward, political fragmentation in government-held areas, maybe not fragmentation, but uh, let's say a uh, diversification of of influence may not be such a bad thing. Uh, and I guess the only goal is just ensuring that, that it doesn't cement displacement uh, and it doesn't allow the government to, to, to basically uh, shore up uh, the communities that have supported them. Or uh, what we're seeing kind of right now, which is that there are these fairly strategic areas, you know, things like, uh, you know, the road from Damascus to the airport, uh, which I don't know if you've been to Beirut, but but will be reconstructed in such a way that let's say the local inhabitants, which which you know uh, previously were from a fairly kind of low income background, uh, that they're neighbor that they're never able to return. In this kind of was it Le Corbusier? I mean, this is what the regime would like to do uh, uh, with with this reconstruction money, and and so I guess this is I mean that's the worst case. So anything short of that is is a Great victory. So, so you, you've highlighted the importance of the mechanism by which aid is allocated and yeah. monitored, which I'm sure is a real challenge. Acknowledging that success is likely to be in small steps over a long time, what would success look like? How do we know that things are working? What would you like to see as early signs? Mm. Yeah, you. <laughs> <laughs> I, so, so I guess, I mean, it depends who you talk to, right? Like, the, for the European success would be uh, 
safe, you know, returns. Um, what about for the Syrians? So this is the end of phase one of the conflict, right? But but there is definitely phase two coming, um, with without question, uh, because I guess these core grievances, um, and Rebecca, I'm looking at you, these core grievances have never been addressed, right? Um, then in fact they're worse now than I think they were before the conflict began. Um, I don't know what you do. No. You know, I should back up and say that we should have. We, I should have mentioned this earlier. We 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 should have had a third person on, on a third panelist, Madeline Thomas, uh, Peter's colleague. She's not very far away. She's in Canada, but because she's a Syrian national and our government has a policy that's just made it impossible for her to be here, and I'm ashamed that she's not here. Um, I think uh, there's been a revolution against a regime, and it's been suppressed with with. Uh, Iranian and Russian help, um, and it, in many ways, some of the revolution backfired in that it op created openings for all kinds of, 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 of mil militant uh, fundament fundamentalists that, that had different kind of intolerance, obviously. Um, there is still hope that as a result of this resistance, the Syrian people rose up because, because the, the way the, the regime was, was uh, restricting power and 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 manipulating the the, uh, the communities was 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 intolerable, and is there any hope that, that the Assad regime will be different as will be a different Assad regime afterwards? Uh, not much. I, w I was trying to say what kinds of engagement with foreign donors could they use to try to maximize the probability that uh, that that the regime will be a little different, and will for. If, if the West insists on it and provides some incentives for the regime, perhaps allow um, some people to begin to serve their community in ways that make Syrians better off. Obviously, the number one way we would tell things were better is if everybody wants to go back home. Uh, and that should be the goal. You don't look like an optimistic man. I I just don't know how, how you achieve this. Yeah. Um, and I guess there's no, I mean, I guess we as the U.S., but, but I guess we also as kind of the international community, um, I don't see how you reform the regime. Uh, I mean, we've been kind of waiting to see if the Russians, since 2016, if all of a sudden there's a surprise kind of bombing by ISIS and, you know, um, Kalas comes back into power or someone like that. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess everyone looks to the Astana process and, and hopes that, that, that there's a way to, to create a more inclusive uh, and just society. Um, so, inshallah. Yeah. So I, I think we have time for just a couple of questions from the audience. Given the short time horizon, I think we should accumulate a few questions and then let our yeah. panelists respond. And I think the lights will come up, but I can see even one hand in the dark. There we go. And I think a mic is coming your way. Um, I was involved in the formation of the local councils, each of those local councils. I'm very confused by the presentation. Um, local councils are not considered by pretty much anyone as a major achievement by the West or by the Syrians. This was a Western construct that was foistered on the Syrians to give a face to the service provision which was, was mentioned. There wasn't a quick comment and then a question based on that. There really wasn't any space between the local councils and civil society. So the service provision was done through the civil society actors, through the local councils, local council brand, but the service provision was not done through the local councils. So my question is, how did the service provision in the rebel-controlled areas, the so-called liberated areas, contribute to the fragmentation, or how could it have been done differently? Thanks, and let's get uh, one or two more questions and then let our panelists respond. I see a hand in the front here. There we go, Mike coming your way. Hello, uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, this panel. It's extremely interesting and both of you are, uh, I mean, extremely knowledgeable about the subject. Uh, 
Um, I, I wanted to ask, um, you know, the kind of reconstruction idea that you proposed here um, would basically entail kind of shifting or creating focus on areas that have been reconquered by the regime and monitoring the situation happening there. Um, currently, people who are returning, refugees, are being arrested. Uh, Dara and, uh, and northern Homs and uh, eastern Ghouta, people are being arrested there. There are severe restrictions on freedom of movement of people. Uh, the UN has information about cancer patients, other types of people who require treatment in Damascus and are not being allowed to go there for treatment. They're essentially still under siege in eastern Ghouta. So uh, for this reconstruction to even begin, people need to have some basic rights, like the freedom to move. How uh, can international, how can you be hopeful about a reconstruction process when even like people are in a way still living uh, under a constant kind of a cloud of suspicion, the regime sees them as they may have surrendered, but they are, you know, still kind of a enemy population. Right. Those are two very meaty questions, so I think I will turn to you to answer. Okay. So, just to start with, I'm not hopeful at all for the reconstruction. Uh, then I then I agree with you, um, and then I don't know how you stop that from happening. Um, like I said, I don't know how you reform the regime. I guess going to the council question, um, I mean, so that was not part of the team that built local councils. I, but I guess when you look at things like HTS and, and I guess DICES as well, it seems like they were successful because, I guess, let's say three major reasons, right? One, they had independent access to resources. So in the case of HTS, it's, it's the border crossing, it's, uh, so it's Bab al Hawa, Morek, and I guess to a lesser extent, Kalat Malik. Um, and with ISIS, it's, it's the Ambari kind of hand filtered fuel. Uh, they, I guess the other piece that made them successful was that, you know, so, so one, they had control over resources which they could use to provide services directly to people. And two, they, they obviously had had uh, control over over the armed groups because it was them. Uh, and I guess I didn't see any of those factors, with the exception of Daraya, I guess. Uh, I think that's the one community that I can, parts of the south, but, but, but that's obviously kind of more Horani tribalism or clan behavior than anything else. But by and large, these councils, yeah, they were just as you said, they were coordination committees. Um, then I'm not a PhD, but, but I guess I just kind of contrast them to the success of, of what we would call radical the extremist groups who were much better integrated in terms of governance and service provision in the military capacity. Over to you, Roger. I, I think the problems you quoted of, of, of the regime manipulating and not allowing cancer patients to... I, I've heard, I understand the regime wants to make sure it owns all the hospitals. Uh, that that, that uh, this this is um, this is it, this means that any hel any ho any help that's given is either going to be channeled only to the regime and its supporters and to build up, or or unless in which case it's hopeless. If there's any hope, it's going to come from monitoring these abuses by the regime, holding them accountable, th and 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 having the, the donors donor nations be ready to withdraw their aid en masse when there's an abuse, whether to refuse to allow it in a district where, where, the, where the abuses happen or to withdraw it from the entire country. Um, I, I oversimplified, of course, that uh, the, uh, the United States, I know, did try to engage with, with, with uh, Rick Barton's book, talks about trying to help uh, the, the local police force in Aleppo, but not being allowed to give the money because of the uh, uh, they, the need to vet that absolutely every policeman who was receiving any money from the United States uh, assistance was had never been involved with any terrorist organization, and that required vetting and whatever that that, that was of course physically impossible. Uh, that that we weren't set up to 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 give really effective aid. But the other side of it is to recognize um, that. That what, that is, let me put it a different way, as a, as a general fundamental principle, societies depend on having, a, a, the pros, a prosperous democratic society 
depends on, on having an ample supply of people with good reputations for exercising public funds and public power responsibly to serve their communities. If that only exists in, in an abusive society, if that only abuse exists in small communities, then you start with the communities. Um, an inclusive council, that, that inclusive council organizations that were meant to, deliberately meant to include people from different uh, um, ethnic and religious groups and sects that the, that, the, that the regime had tried to pit against each other, that to give those people collectively the, the, some power in administering um, public services was to make a, a, a deep political change. And while the humanitarian needs are also to be met, uh, the prosperity of people ultimately depends on being part of a functional a society with a functional political system. And, and I'm arguing that the, the, while investing in aid, we also need to invest in monitoring the usage of the aid with a sensitivity to the creating opportunities for people to begin to develop Lo local forms of local community, trusted local community leadership to encourage trusted commun local community leadership is as important as getting roads and schools put back together again. Um, and uh, that is the issue, and, and it's not, since the Assad regime has never, tr has always discouraged that, there's every reason to fear that there's nothing that can be done and that Syria is going to, is, is going to be ma maintain, be a, a, for, for, for years to come a place that many, many Syrian refugees will not want to return to because they will fear uh, for their lives if they do and, and they will not see a, a community that they want to live in. Uh, that, for humanitarian reasons and for selfish reasons of the West, uh, there's lots of reasons to think that if there's any way to spend money to do it, and part of what I was trying to say is it's not just aid, it's, it's also a diplomatic, a kind of depth of diplomatic investment not just at the national level, but it would lo at the local level that would be expensive, but, but would be a, a good investment both for helping people in a very needy country and for serving the interests of the West. Well, that seems like a really important note to end on. So please join me in thanking our panelists for this really illuminating conversation.